This is Danny Flexant here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by Dan Lawrence, Perform365. Dan, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Danny. Thanks for having me on. Anytime. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Um, you're obviously a performance management specialist for Tony Sims's group of fighters at the Matchroom Elite Gym. I guess, first of all, just tell us how that came about, how you linked up with Tony in, in his stable. It came about a few years ago. It's actually just over four years, Danny, since I've been in that role as head of performance with Matchroom and working with Tony's fighters specifically. And uh, it was Charlie Sims, I believe, who reached out Tony's son through one of my colleagues, Rob Madden, who's a physiotherapist who's worked with none other than Mr. Anthony Joshua. So lots of, uh, I'd worked in boxing for a long while. I'd worked with George Groves and a number of other fighters. And uh, yeah, started building a relationship there. And it's been an amazing four years of progression for a lot of the fighters. And it's just been great working closely with Tony, who's uh, just such a, such a top coach. How would you define your role? Performance management in a way of, we have four key pillars of performance. So training, nutrition, uh, mindset and recovery. Mindset is the kind of glue that holds everything together. And thankfully in the sport of boxing, we don't really need to cover that as much as other areas like general population, normal individuals or some other sports because they are just such driven individuals. Uh, so look, we, yeah, we have synergy between the nutrition strategy and the training strategy, of course. It's not just about being fueled for every single training session because we're in a sport that's governed by making weight. So unless they don't make, if they don't make weight, they don't fight. It's simple as that so um, yeah I basically do anything that will have a positive return on performance so if there's anything that falls under that banner then you know we'll take care of it. Describe your day to day for us what does the schedule look like? In regards to the fighters specifically, uh, so I'm at the Matchroom Gyms on Wednesdays and they come to see me in the Gym BXR in Marlebone on Saturdays. And uh, I work with a number of fighters who, they all have their own specific program. Some fighters do double up just because of time constraints. And uh, it's one of those, it's not just clocking off, you know, after the hour, see you later and never having any engagement with the fighters. You can imagine uh, I work with Connor Ben, who's quite an intense individual who, who wants to know every aspect <laughs> of high performance, which is great for me as a coach because he's such a model student, but uh, it does mean the phone rings are all out. Hours, but my motto is above and beyond Danny to be honest you know I'll do anything I can that will have a positive return I'm all in with my fighters as they well know which is why I have to be selective in who, who I can coach and I can only work with a certain amount but uh, for those who are you know willing to buy into the methods then like I say I'm all in with them and we win together you know just tell us about Ryder specifically how the nutritional uh, outlook has changed because when he was at middleweight it was a bit of a struggle for him to make it but you had to do it safely and healthily now he's at super middle. Now you want him to be as strong as possible as well. How does that change what you do? Yeah, I didn't work with John when he was a middleweight, but when he stepped up to super middle, we've been working together since. And, you know, John's been, again, I mentioned Connor there being a model student. John's been brilliant. He just really, again, wants to know the why behind things, but is is willing to just take everything on board to, again, get those small percentages. Because fundamentally, Danny, we're at elite, the elite level here. You know, they're all incredible fighters, but if there are small percentages, that can be the difference between winning and losing. So going from 160 to 168, like I say, I wasn't involved in that transition, but I did jump on board with John and, and Tony and the team from uh, you know when he was a super middleweight so it just meant he could fuel optimally for sessions he's a strong individual anyway we jokingly say he's nicknamed the gorilla he is mm. such a force dominant individual he's very strong we've tried to make strength super strength to make him even stronger to you know without boring your listeners to raise the upper limit of force production that then when we do more explosive movements and by the way that's an area that John as he knows could have improved and has improved immensely and we've got the data to prove that um, that uh, yeah w that we he, he then has a bigger pot to pull from so to speak because we've got him stronger now we can execute those movements with uh, with more explosiveness and uh, we can fuel the sessions as well because if we're trying to chase these percentages we're trying to elicit these these high outputs from a, from a performance point of view and he's under fueled every session he's just never going to yield that return with what we're looking for you know how do you balance the amount of fuel he needs with kind of keeping him motivated and happy because it, the diet of an athlete isn't always the most kind of inspiring yeah, we, we do have little hacks in there. Um, some fighters, even on fight week, might get a, a tub of ice cream before uh, before they weigh in, which, you know, two, three years ago would have been unheard of. <laughs> Small tub of low calorie ice cream, I'll specify, yeah. But we they get a lot of psychological benefit from that, you know, so... Um, yeah, in terms of in terms of the nutrition strategy, it is very much tailored to each individual. I must, you know, admit we, we do outsource a lot of our nutritional work. I do work with the nutrition; it's not my area of, of expertise. But again, like I say, if it is going to, which evidently nutrition is, if it is going to have an effect on performance, then I, I have to tailor that to my fighters. And we do like a high-low strategy from a fueling point of view. Like I say, not every day can be fueled maximally because they won't make weight. Um, but we have to tailor that hand in glove training and nutrition merging together as one. 
Now on the strength and conditioning side, you mentioned that John's come on leaps and bounds in his explosive um, power and his explosive movements. What sort of thing, without giving away too many trade secrets, what sort of exercises or what sort of things do you do with him to bring that out? Yeah, there won't be any secrets. You know, I've got hmm. a few guides out there and things that, that basically give access to to my system. So we, we don't do anything untoward. But uh, we, um, we, I don't know if your listeners will know the specifics. We do a lot of explosive work, a lot of jumping, but it's not just aimless jumping. Uh, we do it, uh, we're trying to elicit neuromuscular out outcomes. So we're, we're trying to give give the neuromuscular system a, a appropriate stimulus, but not too much of a stimulus. Remember, these guys are... For me, they're chronically overtrained, generally speaking. So we, um, if we are trying to chase those high outputs, we have to optimize recovery as well. So it is just balanced. There's so many moving parts, but uh, yeah, things like jump squats, counter movement jumps, explosive movements, kettlebell swings. We actually did a taper session today. Uh, we got the lads in the gym there and just gave them a little bit of a stimulus so they felt better than they walked in the gym and uh, and didn't overload them too much. So we just literally sharpened the knife in advance of Saturday night. Um, but in terms of exercise specifics, trap bar jumps, kettlebell swings, counter movement jumps i've probably lost your listeners again but anyway i'm sure most of them all, all have some knowledge of s and c plyometrics and so on yeah, but um just give us an idea we'll, we'll do some kind of quick fire a fighter answer for each one if you don't mind who was when you first started the most nutritionally and strength and conditioning wise informed already Connor ben who's the most you don't want to say dedicated because they're all dedicated who, who's the most competitive <laughs> Connor Ben. <laughs> yeah, These are all going to end up being Connor Ben, aren't they? Who's the biggest challenge in terms of what you're trying to achieve? Maybe you can explain why as well. Hmm, that's a good one. This won't be quick fire. Who's the that's biggest cool. challenge? Felix Cash. Um, just changing and shifting an outlook on what high performance is and understanding that it's not just boxing that's going to improve the boxing. There's other aspects to it, like we said about our big rocks or pillars of performance. Training, nutrition, recovery and mindset feed into him becoming a better boxer. And that's been a process, but it's a process that he's wholeheartedly bought into now. But that was, it takes a while to build trust. But when the likes of Felix and some of the newer athletes that I've worked with can see the improvements the likes of Conor Ben, John Ryder and previous other fighters that I've worked with as well um, have had that they think, okay, I and, and then they talk to me and they realise I actually care and, and may know a thing or two about helping them. So yeah, they, they buy into it. But yeah, maybe Felix has been a transition, but uh, you know, he's, he's wholeheartedly bought in now. That wasn't quick fire, apologies. <laughs> no, that's fine. What's been the biggest kind of mistake that a boxer's made that you've heard about? Not necessarily while you've been working with them, but in the past, and you've kind of shook your head of, wow, you were really doing that. I think they always try and do more and doing more work is not always the optimal strategy. So we say, you know, smart work over hard work sometimes. These guys will always work hard. They'll run through walls for you, but pulling back and optimizing recovery so we can achieve those, uh, you know, like I said, high neuromuscular outputs in the gym-based environment to optimize performance. That can be where we see some, some magic. So... Um, like a fighter I work with now, Josh, Josh Taylor, he um, he is such a million miles an hour type A male, wants to chase every percentage of performance, which is amazing as a coach. But sometimes you need to pull them back to save themselves and be looking at things on a macro level, a bigger picture, than just a micro level about that one incredible session that they had, because that will then have a dominoes effect and bleed into the other training days. Um, so yeah, we optimize sleep, we look at various data, so this is an aura ring, it looks at HRV and, and kind of resting heart rate and things as well. So yeah, we, we look at every aspect that's going to improve performance who's the one that does absolutely everything you say without questioning it john Ryder. yeah and that's probably a good thing i guess no having the strength to admit other people know more in certain areas i think so and i think to be honest that's one of tony sim's biggest traits as well and that's why he got me involved you know tony's got a lot of skin in the game and uh, but he was aware that there was an area that could have been improved and he outsourced that and together cohesively we've got an incredible team and working relationship i also work closely with ben davison with, with a couple of his fighters so again same thing i think that's that's you've got to identify your strengths but also know that there are areas that you can improve on so um yeah i i think tony yeah tony would probably be the best answer to that question do you find boxing is evolving in that sense in that they're more open to outside influence now? I think so. Again, we're in a sport that's 
you haven't got 10 other teammates backing you up if you have a bad day at the office. You end up on your ass and you're you know you're fighting for the, pun intended, you're fighting them for the next eight months to try and get another fight and get back on these kind of big shows and big cards. It's a brutal sport, as we, we all know, Danny. So I think, you know, if there's something there that you that can potentially improve performance, why would they not be open to it? And also we see these huge global superstars, the Anthony Joshua's, the, you know, the Canelo Alvarez, they've now posted all of their kind of strength and conditioning online. And it has been a process. You know, I worked with George Groves in I think 2012 2013 and that was it was very early days then um, but uh, it's been great to see the evolution of it and look we, we stay in our lane as well Danny I think fundamentally we're not saying it's it's all about that side of things we are adding a small percentage to the overall athlete and fighter and they have to be a great fighter anyway but if we can make them a little bit better and uh, then, then you know we've done our job Dan Lawrence perform 365 really appreciate it Danny, appreciate your time. thank you mate is that right yeah great I thought <laughs> Just lashing out.